He had a leading role in the second Andrel hole in Southern McMurdo Sound. Um, and uh, uh, since then, uh, was lead on a project that didn't like it. It was uh, really hard on the whole community, but that has led in turn to uh, the last decade, and he's been working with others on this, uh, this Waste to Sea Consortium. And Richard will give us the big picture. Um, now, the pro project is crucially dependent on a new technology, both in reaching the seafloor through an ice shelf, but also recovering the core. And these aspects are going to be covered by two other uh, Victoria and Partikins, Jane Chewings here on the hot water drilling, and Darcy Mandino, um, drilling engineer. And we'll conclude with uh, Linda, uh, a master, was a master student working on core from the area, uh, but this time she's a PhD student working on core from the drill site. So um, just before we start, I'd like to acknowledge Stephanie Endersey here. He's uh, taking time out from his ocean modeling day job to manage the IT system through which the talks are being recorded and through which another 30 or so people are joining us online. So thank you, Stephen, and welcome, Richard. I'm going to talk to you about the Space 2C project today um, at a pretty high level, just to outline the science that we're, we're trying to do um, as part of the project. Sensitivity of the West Antarctic ice sheet to two degrees Celsius is, is what SWACE 2C stands for. And it's really about that. It's trying to figure out just how the ice sheet will respond as we warm the planet 1.5, 2 degrees and, and beyond. What will happen to the Ross Ice Shelf and the, and the West Antarctic ice sheet. And with most of these large um, drilling projects, it's something we can't do by ourselves in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, this is building, as Peter's already alluded to, on a long history of international drilling projects that involve collaborators um, from around the world, funders from funding from around the world. And you can see a little bit of a logo soup up there on that, uh, that, that slide highlighting the, the key partners of the Swayze 2C project. So a lot of these um, drilling efforts are difficult in the field, but it takes years and years to, to get them up and running, bringing the, the, the partners together, bringing the funding together. And so I just want to acknowledge that, that what we're about to show you uh, tonight is, is, a, is a collaboration of many, many, many people from around the world pulling this thing together, which makes it really cool. It's really cool to be able to work with all of these different um, nations, different, different cultures. Just want to acknowledge Tina van der Flirt, my co-chief scientist on the first drilling site that we're going to talk about tonight at KISS3, but also the other science leadership team members listed up there, um, including uh, some Vic grads uh, or Vic alums, uh, Hugh Horgan, and of course, Gavin Dunbar, our, our drilling science coordinator. Uh, Peter's already highlighted the fact that you'll be hearing from several speakers tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm the first, I'm going to give you the reason why we're doing these things. And as Peter sort of alluded to already, Jane will talk about hot water drilling, Darcy, some of the sediment coring, and then Linda's going to uh, talk a little bit about what we found in terms of the science we achieved this year. But um, just want to ask you before I move on, that, that slide, the background, um, does anyone who wasn't at KISS3 know um, what that is an image of? Or want to hazard a guess? It's a very important part of our, our um, camp structure. It's not the toilet, but it's kind of kind of close. You have to go down here, extract some things first, consume them before you go to the toilet, Peter. So that, that's our freezer. That's where we kept our um, food cold, dug a hole, and you can. We're actually looking up the steps to the tent that sits above the the hole at the surface of of the ice shelf. So this is dug into the fern of the of the ice shelf to keep all of our um, food cold while we're in the field. I think it was minus. 27 degrees, maybe even colder, 37 degrees down there. So it's a pretty chilly spot, but amazingly beautiful image. All right, so just a bit, provide a little bit of context and, and remind us why this project is important. Um, this graph here is a temperature record uh, since uh, of, of average surface temperature on, at, at, across the planet um, from 1920 to 2020. And it's showing that upward trend going from zero degrees baseline in 1920 up to 
yeah, approaching 1.2, 1.3 degrees of warming over the over that 100 year period. And what's really key in this figure is the projection for this year for 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 the over the last 12 months. It's the first time we were um, anticipating exceeding 1.5 degrees centigrade temperature above pre-industrial. So that magical 1.5 degree temperature that we hear about, um, that the Paris Agreement is, is an attempt to get all the governments and nations across the world to keep CO2 levels low enough so that warming doesn't exceed 1.5 or we keep it as close to 1.5 as possible. This year we were, we were anticipating exceeding 1.5 for the first time. Now this is in part because, we, um, because of El Nino, um, the natural variability of climate on top of that um, average warming was supposed to push us up above 1.5. I think we've become close, maybe we haven't quite exceeded it, but it was acknowledged in the media at the time, the World Meteorological Organization statements like this, that we're in un uncharted territory. Um, this is a worrying news for the planet, um, the Director of Climate Services of the WMO. So we, we're right at that 1.5 degree threshold. And what we're really interested in understanding from an Antarctic perspective is how will the, the Ross ice shelf or the large ice shelves that surround Antarctica and the West Antarctic ice sheet respond to that amount of warming? Does 1.5 degrees Celsius represent a threshold across which we will start to see warming such that the ice shelves and the ice sheet retreat and we actually can't slow or stop that, um, that retreat. This is a question that's still um, much discussed in, in the scientific world. We Many of our colleagues think we may have already crossed the threshold, um, but we're not in, entirely sure. And that's, that's really what a lot of the scientific effort, um, not just in the Space 2C project, but in other projects around the world are really focused on. Um, the diagram there showing the, the, the map of Antarctica without an ice sheet is just to highlight the regions of the Antarctic continent that have ice that, is, that, that sits on land below sea level, what we call marine-based ice sheets. And we think they're the most vulnerable parts of Antarctica, or we know they're the most vulnerable parts of Antarctica, because they're directly in touch with the ocean as the ocean warms, that ice will start to melt and those regions will start to retreat. And you can see this large area here, West Antarctica, where most of the ice sits on land below sea level. But there are large portions of East Antarctica that also sit on land below sea level. What will 1.5 degrees C increase in temperature do to these regions? Now, one of the, the, the big concerns is, again, how will warming oceans affect these ice sheets? Um, ocean heat is key. The Southern Ocean is warming. It's been um, documented. We're observing the warming of the Southern Ocean, the ocean that surrounds Antarctica. And some of that warming ocean is starting to flow up onto the continental shelf and interact with the ice sheet that's grounded below the sea, causing that ice sheet to melt. There are parts of um, Antarctica, the Thwaites um, Glacier region, where there's already warm water up on the continental shelf bathing those regions. And you'll often uh, read about this region in the news, the Doomsday Glacier it gets a lot of media attention because it is um, starting to lose mass at a, at a, at a, at a, at a fairly uh, fast rate. It is starting to lose um, increase in velocity and retreat. It's an area that's um, known to be highly vulnerable. But there are other parts of the Antarctic continent, um, the Ross Sea, for example, where the warm water isn't yet coming up onto the continental shelf and bathing the ice sheet. It's, it's a cold ice shelf cavity um, in, the, in that diagram um, below. So the temperatures on the ice shelf are still cold and the melting of the ice shelf is, um, is not yet happening. And the diagram on, on the right here, can you see that? This, this one here, this rather busy... Um, diagram showing all of the, the colors from blues to reds. That, that's a recent paper highlighting regions where the ice shelf is actually losing mass or gaining mass. Blue are areas where the ice shelves are gaining mass. Reds are the areas where the ice shelves are losing mass. And again, you can see right around the, the Antarctic Peninsula towards the Thwaites Glacier region, that's where the ice shelves are actually losing mass melting now. These are observations. But again, if you look at the Ross Ice Shelf, the Ross Sea, um, the mass is, is, is actually gaining in places. So it's that cold cavity that's still um, not being affected by, by climate warming. That, that's, that's a good sign, right? There was a paper that came out last year um, by Caitlin Norton, who's done some work with, with colleagues at Victoria University. Um, and this paper was, was quite alarming to, to me and to many of our, our colleagues. Um, it also got picked up in the media. Um, uh, this is an article from The Guardian, Rapid Ice 
melt in West Antarctica. Now, inevitable re research shows. And actually, the abstract in that paper is, is written at the bottom there. These results suggest that mitigation of greenhouse gases now has limited power to prevent ocean warming that could lead to the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. So this paper, this was a modelling paper using observations, was basically saying, regardless of what we do with our emissions, there's enough warm water already on the continental shelf next to this ice shelf near the Thwaites Glacier that no matter what we do, even if we start to slow our emissions down, we can't stop melt of the ice in this region, and it's going to lead to collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. But as I've just said, the Ross ice shelf is still cold, so there are still big questions about whether that ice shelf cavity will flip to a warm cavity and start melting or not. These are questions we're still trying to figure out. Have we crossed a threshold across which all of the ice shelf cavities around the Antarctic will flip to warm and cause melt? Or can we still do some work, keep emissions low, and keep some of those large ice shelves intact, which may slow down the retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet? Now, one of the ways that we try to attack this question to find out whether or not we may have crossed such a threshold is to look back into the past, to use, use Earth's past warming experiments. So natural intervals of warmth in Earth's history that we can go back, look at records from the Antarctic to see what the Ross Ice Shelf did the last time Earth's temperature was 1.52 degrees warmer than today. If we can find evidence that suggests the ice shelf stuck around when it was most recently that warm, then perhaps, again, it gives us some um, indication that we haven't yet crossed that, that key temperature threshold. Perhaps we have to push to two to two and a half degrees before, before we lose the Ross Ice Shelf. So just like in the movie, going back to the future, but our time machine is a, is a drill rig. Um, we have evidence from around the world, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the past intervals of warmth that we're, we're particularly interested in, something we call the last interglacial or the penultimate interglacial marine isotope stage five. It's the last time that Earth's temperature was naturally warm before it goes into an ice age and warms again into the period in which we live the Holocene. So the, the previous interglacial is a time period where data from around the world suggests Average temperatures across the Earth's surface were one degree warmer than pre-industrial. And at that, under that, those conditions, there are sea level reconstructions from around the world. And here's one example from Sardinia in the Mediterranean, um, where sea level records suggest that, um, that the mean sea level was up to nine metres higher than today, when Earth's temperatures were only one degree warmer than pre-industrial. So it's little pieces of information like this that, that raise some concern, because that suggests that most of Greenland and large parts of West Antarctica must have, have melted in order to cause sea level to be that much higher. There are other records from around the world, however, that suggest maybe sea level was only as much as five metres higher, still higher than today, but maybe not nine. So there's a lot of work still trying to refine these, these sea level records. So that's the far field indication of what the ice sheets do when Earth's temperature was 1.5 degrees, 1 to 1.5 degrees warmer than present. When we come to Antarctica, evidence for what the ice sheets did under these past warm conditions under the last interglacial, um, during the last interglacial period, are relatively rare. They're in fact incredibly rare. There are some hints, though, and here's one example in a paper that was published um, just recently, just in, while we were actually down drilling in, in the Antarctic, includes some of uh, our colleagues at, at the Antarctic Research Centre um, were co-authors on this paper. But it was really a cool study where some molecular biologists, some people that study the DNA of, of octopuses, octopuses, yeah, it's not octopi, I got told this the other day, octopuses, we're, we're looking at the distribution of uh, um, the molecular similarities or dissimilarities of octopuses around the margin of Antarctica. And there's this particular species um, shown on, on, the, on the slide there that has quite distinct genetic code today because they're isolated. Their populations are isolated to the Weddell Sea, the eastern margin of Antarctica, and the Ross Sea. But... The, when you start looking at the molecular clock and looking at when that when that when they started to actually separate in their in their DNA, they can actually show that they were similar. They must have been linked as recently as about hundred thousand years ago. So there must have been seaways through which these octopuses and their larvae were swimming and walking, um, linking the Weddell Sea to the Ross Sea as recently as hundred thousand years ago. So that molecular clock suggests the West Antarctic ice sheet had collapsed and there were connections as recently as the last interglacial. 
So sort of evidence that suggests under one degree of warming, the West Antarctic ice sheet collapses, but still it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's debated. So what we're trying to do is go to um, as close as we can to the center of the West Antarctica, right next to the grounding zone at the point where the ice sheet starts to float and form the, the Ross ice shelf, drill through the ice shelf using hot water that Jane will talk about into the seafloor using a technique that Darcy will talk about to recover records of past environmental change at that location. If we look down below the ice shelf today, what you see is a certain type of sediment, a sub ice shelf sediment, sediments that typically form beneath uh, in, in a marine environment covered by a thick ice shelf. If we were to drill down and find the last interglacial and see no change in sedimentation type, we would say, ah, the Ross ice shelf never disappeared. But if we find during the last interglacial that there are open marine sediments, sediments composed of marine algae, diatoms, it suggests that the Ross ice shelf, or it tells us that the Ross ice shelf had collapsed and there were open marine conditions. So it's using the rocks and the, and the fossils they contain to help us interpret the past environmental conditions that then tell us what the ice shelf did under those past environmental conditions. So that's the goal. This year, we travelled out to the first site. We're drilling at two sites, KISS-3 and Prairie Ice Rise. This year, we travelled out to the, um, to the site, a, a map showing you there the traverse route from, from Scott Base out to the Cycle Coast, and then a zoom in uh, close up on the, on the three sites that we've been working at. KISS-3 is the latest where we're actually going to do the deep drilling. Drove out there um, using this equipment, so Antarctica New Zealand, great, grateful for our awesome support from Antarctica New Zealand. A team of Traverse, um, the, the Traverse crew drove about 1,200 kilometres, two weeks of driving at about 15 kilometres per hour out to the uh, to the site, dragging all of our equipment, our fuel and our, our drilling gear. So um, so really an impressive effort, impressive logistical effort to get out to the site. This isn't just stuff you can do, you know, get up in the morning at Scott Base, have your breakfast, pop out, make a little hole in the ice and, and, and do some science. This is, this is some pretty serious uh, um, logistically intensive stuff. The scientists and most of the drillers luckily got to fly out to the site. Um, again, nod thanks to the, um, to the United States Antarctic Program. One of the benefits of having these international projects where you, where you bring um, logistics, pull logistics from a range of different um, countries means that we had access to the Basley aircraft, which really made it incredibly easy for us to jump on a plane, fly three hours out and land at the, um, at the KISS-3 site to do our work. So most of the scientists, most of the drillers flew out um, on these airframes. Uh, just a little note, as we, as we were flying out, um, we were told by the pilot that the airframe itself, on the, I think it was on this particular aircraft, was built in 1944, 44 or 43, 44, and that this aircraft actually flew in D-Day. It was slightly different colours, but um, yeah, fl flew in D-Day, which is quite remarkable that you're sitting in these, these uh, amazingly old planes that have been obviously refurbished, but yeah, a bit of history there. Um, this is an image of the I can get it to work. Of course, I my card. Of a video that Anthony Powell from Antarctica, New Zealand, um, collected for us using a drone. Just to give you a sense of the of the drill site itself. Um, the big red tent in the in the middle there is the drill tent, and and all of the stuff scattered around it is Webster Drilling Company's mess. Um, <laughs> It was actually really well organized, I have to say. It's a really impressive operation to watch these guys work. But that's the little drill rig and, and all the drill pipe and so on and so forth that, that Darcy will talk to us a little bit about. The blue containers had all the hot water drilling system. So again, rather a massive effort to get all of this stuff out, organized, put up, and, um, and, and so that we can actually do our science. In the background there, you can see the tent city, all of the Scott tents and, and other things. So again, quite an impressive effort um, just, to, just to get going. And so, yeah, so I hope that's given you a, a bit of a taste of, of the setup of what we um, of, of what we were wanting to do, the high-level science, the importance of the science, what will the Ross Ice Shelf do as we cross 1.5 degrees and head to 2? Will it collapse? Will it cause the West Antarctic Ice Sheet to um, retreat and sea level to rise up to 5 metres over the coming decades and, and centuries? A really important question, both globally but also of significance to Aotearoa New Zealand, as we recognise the need to, uh, to have to adapt to...
sea level rise, 30 centimetres, unavoidable by the end of the century, possibly more, particularly if the Ross Ice Shelf collapses. So a nod to the team. Here's a, here's a team photo we took. Everyone's looking fairly happy. Um, a really impressive effort, and um, yeah, just just, just it was a, an amazing um, experience to be able to work with with the group out there at the at the Kistri site. Um, I'm going to stop now and let um, Jane tell us how we actually accessed the, the the bottom of the ice shelf, and then then Darcy's going to chat about the drilling, and then Linda will give us some science, and then I think at the end we'll answer questions if that's if that's cool. Good, Tato. Um, thanks all for coming out and listening. Um, it's quite exciting really to get to talk to you about what we did over the summer. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jane Chewings. I'm a Senior Technical Officer at the School of Geography, Environment and Earth Sciences at VIC. Um, and occasionally I'm very fortunate to be able to sit on to the Science Drilling Office in the Antarctic Research Centre there and become a hot water driller. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about the KISS-3 hot water drilling operations and a little bit more. Okay, so just briefly, um, the photo on this slide is one taken by Anthony Powell um, from Antarctica, New Zealand, and it was actually on the uh, Radio New Zealand site, and I just burgled because <laughs> it was so good, and it shows you the, um, the oceanic mooring that was uh, laid out before it was dropped down the hole at the end of the season, and it gives you a bit of an idea about the uh, distances we're dealing with when we're hot water drilling. Uh, so I'll just, I thought it would be worth giving a brief history of sort of borehole drilling in around the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, a few challenges posed by ice shelves for any um, projects like this, uh, the hot water drilling process, and of course, a bit about KISS-3. So I um, thought I'd start with a couple of pictures from some early borehole drilling in the Ross Ice Shelf region. At the top, um, it's about 45 years ago, the US Ross Ice Shelf Project and the US Army Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory um, at J9, site J9, were the first to punch through the Ross Ice Shelf near Prairie Ice Rise. Uh, they kept the hole open for about three weeks. Um, they were also the first to observe life under the ice shelf by a camera that was lowered down the hole. Um, the photos show the browning flame jet drill. That was the um, drilling method. Um, it was actually their second try. So in 1976, they started with a um, rotary wireline rotary drill system, but it became stuck and they weren't able to melt it out with hot water. So they um, opted the following year to try a less satisfactory but um, ultimately successful method of the, the flame jet drill. Um, up on the top right corner, you can see Peter Webb um, holding the first ever surface cores taken from under the ice shelf. Um, and that mud is the real gold. That's obviously what it's all about, what we are trying to get, those archives. Um, in the lower photos, about 20 years ago, we have the Andrew hot water drill system being deployed on the McMurdo ice shelf. Um, and you can see all the water heaters lying on their side on the sled and the mast and hose reel in the centre. Uh, it was a very efficient drill, apparently, and it was used to bore several access holes for Andrew. Um, and in both these examples, you'll note that they're outside in the elements, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, so apparently more is known about Mars than what's beneath the Ross Ice Shelf. So it's a bit of an enigma, and I thought it worth giving a brief, it's probably a bit New Zealand-centric history of borehole exploration in the area. Um, and as seen on the previous slide, the first efforts were at Site J9, near Prairie Ice Rise. I'm not sure if this point is actually shown on the screen. Uh, so hopefully everyone can discern the colours, but it's the orange, orange dot on the map up there. Um, and that was in 1976, 1977. Uh, the sediments recovered were found to be of mixed Miocene age, um, which is about 23 to 5.3 million years old. Uh, work by the Andrew Project in the 2000s focused on uh, the ice shelf edge and provided some first oceanographic data from beneath the ice shelf, the very edge of the ice shelf, and a Cenozoic history 
of Antarctic glaciation, but further work was needed to obtain a history of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet Retreat during past warm periods, as Richard just explained. And so to quote Gavin Dunbar, a hopeful X was placed on the map near Cam Ice Stream at the Cypel Coast um, for future drilling. Meanwhile, further south at Willans Ice Stream, an international team developed an ultra clean hot water drilling capability for Willans Ice Stream Subglacial Access Research Drilling, another big acronym, was it? Uh, to bore down to the subglacial Lake Willans in 2013. And that advanced our knowledge of subglacial biology and uh, the basal dynamics of ice streams and grounding lines. Um, Andrews, so that, sorry, that's the bright yellow dot up the top of that map. Um, Andrews aspirational X on the Cypel Coast led Antarctica New Zealand to develop a new deep field traverse capability. And um, which is what Rich showed you a fantastic photo of. And Vic's Antarctic Research Centre Science Drilling Office developed a new portable hot water drilling system. So after testing the hot water drilling system at Windless Bight in 2016, which is down on the bottom right corner there, um, the, uh, the system was first deployed to the Ross Ice Shelf interior for the Anzari funded Ross Ice Shelf project for hot water drill 2A and B in uh, 2017, sorry, and 18. So the whole A was for a permanent oceanographic mooring and whole B for a suite of borehole science. Um, during the season, a traverse route was proven by Antarctica New Zealand, which enabled the progress of the next target sites near Camp Ice Stream. Uh, so just to point out, the green dot in the centre there is the hot water drill 2, and those blue and uh, purplish ones are the Cam Ice Stream sites. Um, so these were first near the grounding line, second over a subglacial channel, and finally our most recent season at Cus 3. Um, regarding the values in the table, um, just a couple of things to note is how the ice thickens as it moves south towards the grounding line from the carving line at the edge, and how also the ocean cavity shallows up. So obviously the further into the interior we go, the more ice we've got to bore through. Uh, so this is a um, photo from this season. It's showing the um, hot water drill tent and uh, the generators outside. Um, so it's, as I said, it was uh, designed and built by the Science Drilling Office. It's a modified version of the BAS, um, British Antarctic Survey Modular Hot Water Drill, uh, commissioned at Winners Bight in 2016. Uh, it has a maximum flow of 150 litres a minute up to 60, 80 degrees Celsius, um, and it can deploy up to 1,000 metres deep. And to date, it's drilled at about six, uh, drilled at six different boreholes. So um, ice shelves, they both pose a few challenges, um, which is pretty obvious, really. Um, there's no infrastructure, fuel supplies, um, away from base, except what you can traverse and fly. Um, it's a, uh, no, so it's no permanent infrastructure out there. So you've basically got to drag and fly anything out there. Uh, there's the ice shelf itself, hundreds of metres thick and underlain by tens to hundreds of metres of ocean. It moves sideways, it moves up and down, it's cold. You can't physically see what's down there or confirm how thick it is until you drop a CTD cast or camera or ROV down the hole. Um, and I put in this diagram, uh, it's from the Hot Water Drill 2 project from Stevens et al, because it has a nice profile of the ice shelf and also the bathymetry below the ice shelf um, where it starts to float is the grounding line. Um, the edge is the carving line. So to orient you, this dark red area on, apologies, I don't have a pointer, dark red area on the right-hand side is um, Ross Island and surrounds, and it has relatively shallow depths. Coleman High is the CH to the west, um, and that profile line cutting through to J9 is, as the crow flies, probably about 800 kilometres. Um, and as uh, Rich pointed out, the actual traverse route goes a slightly different route, so it takes a little bit longer to get there because of crevassing and things. Um, it's also worth noting um, on the profile there, the data limit in the diagram showing the difficulty of obtaining oceanographic data 
from the interior of the Ross Sea. Um, and that was prior to that mooring we put in at Hot Water Drill 2, which has vastly increased our understanding of the oceans um, underneath the Ross Ice Shelf. So what do you do um, to solve these problems? All the things that we've um, kind of been talking about, you invest in new traverse capability and deep field infrastructure. Um, so shout out particularly to John O'Leach at Antarctica New Zealand for that. Um, he worked over many years to actually build that capability up um, within Antarctica New Zealand. Um, develop portable hot water drilling systems. Um, you pick a spot that doesn't move much. Um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, you design um, your engineering and your operations to deal with cold um, and also with tides. And uh, you use as much information as you can get about the target location. Um, so pretty much every single place that we've bored a hole through, there's been a season or several seasons ahead of us um, that have done the geophysical surveys to actually find out um, as much as we can about what is beneath the ice shelf, as they did at uh, Disco Deep this year, Liz. And uh, just briefly, why did it, why did we go all the way out there with our hopeful X or and drilled it? Um, essentially, you can see on the uh, left hand diagram, which is one from Makaiatel. Uh, the um, initial work on the advance and retreat of Ross Ice Shelf over recent geological time. There are flow lines you can see curving from both the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and the East Antarctic Ice Sheet outlet glaciers through the uh, Transantarctic. Sorry. Um, all of the andral investigations set within the red circle, which you can see is a long way away from the current West Antarctic Ice Sheet grounding line, uh, and it contains both West and East Antarctic ice. The figure on the right is a rather nice ice velocity map from Rigno et al. Apologies if I mispronounced the name. Um, so it's not bathymetry, but it's um, the ice shelf surface velocity. And you can see there's a grounding line in black penciled over the top. Uh, and the fastest ice moving up to about 3.5 kilometers a year is shown in blue. And the slowest ice is in the golds and browns. Um, and obviously, you can see our hopeful X is sitting over the Cam Ice Stream, one of the um, the golden brown areas. And Cam Ice Stream is a regional scale glacial mechanism that drains the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet, and it's been stalled for about the past 150, 160 years. Um, recent Research from KISS-1 and KISS-2 uh, suggests that it's likely because of a reversing of the subglacial hydrology. And um, where, we're, where we're drilling at Cam Ice Stream, the ice motion is pretty much zero. So it makes it viable for geological drilling. And just to sum up, a um, couple of uh, points on the map showing where the recent drilling has occurred. Um, Hot water drill two out there in the middle, and then we've got the three KISS sites. Um, all sites obtained ice physics, oceanography, surface sediment cores, and microbiology samples. Um, the uh, hot water drill two and KISS one also had an ice, the ice fin um, ROV drop down the hole, um, and the hot water drill uh, mast was modified so that they could do that. Um, and they've supplied some pretty unique footage and sampling data as well. Um, and most recently, obviously at KISS 3, and Linda will talk about this, um, we've obtained the longest uh, greater than 24-hour continuous oceanographic casting for the region, and also the longest surface sediment core, um, finally getting the hammer core to work. Okay, so how do we go about drilling. The next couple of schematics um, have been drawn by Jay Illy, who is um, one of our Copri colleagues who was out on the field team with us. And um, the slide, this slide is showing how things are put together. So down in that bottom left-hand corner, those grey boxes are our generators. 
And we have three um, 18 kVA diesel generators uh, with their own fuel system. Um, they supply power to VSD controllers. Um, so if you follow that line into a little series of boxes in the tent, um, which in turn control the running of six 120 kilowatt high pressure water heaters. Um, so that's down the um, centre front near the little doorway um, with the ducting poking out of them and three cat pumps, which are sitting beside. The pumps circulate water from two 12,000 litre flubber tanks, which are those gold tanks. Um, you can see the little um, dingo operator filling up the snow. Um, and from the uh, heaters onto the hose reel. And the hose is hung over a three metre mast controlled by a capstan winch um, and connected up to an electrical control panel. Um, the hose nozzle and reamer plates are connected with brass weights to hold the nozzle end plumb. And the well pump assembly recirculates the well water back up to keep the flubber tanks level. And there's a whole lot of other plumbing, ducting, electrical cabling, fuel supply, manifolds, flow meters, flooring, you name it, all tucked into that drill tent as well. Um, this schematic is also from Jay. Um, the process once we're operational, she's illustrated it here in five steps. Um, first, the well making. So starting on the uh, left-hand side, um, we make seed water and then we use that to bore a narrow hole to below what has been calculated from geophysical surveys to be sea level. Uh, we drop down an uh, sort of all directions jet nozzle um, to bore out a large meltwater reservoir below sea level. Uh, it's followed by deployment of the well pump, um, well pump assembly, which is then connected into the hot water drill system. Uh, next, we move the rig just to the side of the well hole and we bore a pilot hole to intersect the well. If successful, we keep going and bore all the way to the bottom, which can take many hours. Um, so at this point, we move into split 12-hour shifts um, and have two teams working um, two shifts. Uh, the hole making is followed up by a ream to the desired size, which is um, our largest ream of plates, so 350 millimetres, so about a dinner plate size. And then we hand over to the science team to run camera down, CTD, and um, they check the exit of the holes nice and clean, um, make sure that um, the interface of the well pump is, we're not going to have any issues there. And then um, also we take care not to disturb the seafloor at this point. Um, then you can run um, successive runs of microbiology sampling of the water column and seafloor, uh, gravity coring uh, through the oceanographic casting, and at previous sites, there's also been borehole physics um, down the sort of surveying the ice shelf itself. Um, and finally, if everyone's happy, um, that we've got everything we need to proceed, do another ream of the hole, and uh, the, the geological drill is then moved over the hole, and the riser assembly started to be deployed down hole, which Darcy will tell you more about. Okay, and very quickly at the end, I thought I'd share a few photos. Um, so this is our drill team from KISS-3. Uh, Darcy in the top right there um, is our drill team leader. Um, we've got myself and Headley, who's one of our um, long-standing, oh wow, he's an electrical inspector, not a mere electrician. Um, he's been down many times. Top uh, right is, uh, boys from Webster's, uh, below Tim, our Australian, who comes over as an electrician, uh, next to him Martin, who's um, Irishman living in the UK in London, he's also with the Webster's crew, uh, Sean there, who's normally a policeman, and he comes as our diesel mechanic, uh, and that little uh, inset there you can see is a little house he built while we were down there, um, he's a very talented snow architect. And James had his first season this year with us. He's the um, science drilling officer's engineer and uh, also uh, quite keen on our Antarctic wildlife. And do it. Yep. Um, so this is us putting up the drill tent. It's a um, big, big beast, but if you get the method right, 
um, it actually goes up pretty easily and pretty quickly. Um, we start with the frame, obviously, put the ends on, and then have to winch the um, big orange skin over the top and then snow anchor it all down. Uh, and, oh, I might have lost a photo or two here. Uh, but this is just looking inside the tent as we're setting up. Um, that sort of open space on the uh, right-hand photo with the screwdriver sticking in, that was actually the, the hole. Uh, that's where we located the holes. And uh, we've got the heaters and ducting and things being set up um, in the other photo. And seed water making. Um, so we start with a floor and end up putting up a couple of big tanks, filling them up with snow and melting them with the heaters. And eventually we put enough snow and it melts that we fill them up. And then we are ready for boring our well. And lastly, uh, if things are dull and boring, then things are actually going really well when you're hot water drilling. Uh, both James and I are sitting at the hot water drill console. James' expression shows that we're actually doing really well. Um, and if you haven't had cheds yet, they're really important nourishment for hot water drillers. Um, so I'm just hoeing into some of those in that photo there. Um, need lots of coffee, need some um, yeah, cheds, crosswords. And um, on the other side, you can see the reamer plates about to be lowered down the hole. Uh, once they're gone, there's very little to see. It's basically um, watching the dials go for several hours and taking notes every five minutes. So hot water drilling, when it's um, going well, this is what it looks like. And that's me. Um, I'll hand over to Darcy. Thank you, Jane. Kia ora, everyone. Right. Um, thanks, uh, Richard and Jane. Um, you've got a bit of science context while we're there. Um, you've got the first step in bunging a hole through an ice shelf um, and, and the amount of effort that that takes. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the actual rock sediment um, sub seafloor drilling. Um, as you probably be aware, it didn't go particularly well. We had a few issues, so we'll be talking a little bit about that in some detail and um, how this stuff is really hard and that we need good people to be able to solve these problems so that next time we're successful. Right, so we're, we're using this little, uh, they call it a man portable drill. It's a misnomer because uh, I'd hate to see the size of these Canadian guys, but they must be massive because it's, as you can see there, there's uh, the generators there on the bottom and the blue pallets. Each one of those weighs around about 300 kilos or so. Um, and then the actual rig itself is around about 900. So it's not very personnel portable at all. Uh, but anyway, um, it's relatively lightweight despite that. So it uh, means that it's got a relatively low logistics footprint. Um, and we've got, uh, that, that's the actual rig itself on the left. You can see the chuck, which is the blue thing with the pipe hanging below it. Um, up in the air a little, um, and all the hydraulic hoses connecting that to the main control console. Um, so the whole system itself um, probably weighs in the order of about five or six tons, plus all the pipe that you need. So we've got that hot water hole that James just talked about. Um, we now need a sea riser. So the problem with ice shelves, if you're away from the grounding line sufficiently enough, um, the tidal. So it goes up and down vertically. Fortunately for us, CAM doesn't go sideways. It's um, in theory, it's stalled uh, 160, 150 odd years ago. Um, and that means it makes it a little easier for us to drill. So it means that we don't have to worry about sideways um, loading up of the drill string. Um, so it removes the variable essentially. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we thought it was a great idea to go out there and, and drill a hole. I mean, from an engineering point of view, I'm sorry, Richard, but um, but the, uh, the the rig itself has a capacity of doing around about 5,000 feet, but um, with, with um, I think, B string. But um, we were, we're only looking to go around about 900 or 800 metres or thereabouts. Um, with this particular sea riser, because we're going through uh, a rather cold ice shelf, we've, we've decided to go with um, GRE, which is a glass reinforced epoxy resin pipe, fiberglass. Um, it's produced by an, a company in Houston um, that produce 
pipe and tubulars for the oil industry. And these pipes are typically used in, um, uh, in production wells where they're um, extracting high sulfur content oils so that they can deal with corrosion. Um, so we thought this was a great idea because fiberglass is also a really good thermal insulator. Um, and also uh, in water, it's relatively buoyant. So we thought, great, we're going to have a rig now that increases the capacity. And effectively, we get uh, a rig capable of going in a deeper hole um, with uh, a smaller rig in, in, in a nutshell. So anyway, we chose, we chose GRE for those uh, two primary um, reasons. Um, now, because, well, I should actually just go back to that slide. Um, so you'll see here, uh, this is the GRE. Oh, you won't see it at all, will you? Because you haven't got an arrow. Um, on the left, the, the, the long straight section is all fiberglass. Um, you've got the two dark collars at the bottom there. Um, they are weights um, and a, a, a tidal compensation system to deal with that 2.4 metres of uh, vertical uh, that we've got um, going on with the drawstring. With Andrew and um, and other lot of a lot of other systems, they 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 have heave compensation. They do it all at the surface. With this one, we decided we'd put all the tidal compensation at the bottom. The reason for that is if it did freeze in, at least we could still go up and down, and we wouldn't break our drill string. Um, and the other th the other decision we had made early on was to. Uh, essentially drilled away. So all the chips, and rather than coming to the surface and the cuttings would then be processed, um, we were just going to uh, exit all the cuttings at the bottom at the sea floor. So you could see a little, two little piles of sediments just um, collecting nicely just around the collar there. Um, so this is really just to try and keep the whole system as lightweight as possible. So we don't have to deal with drill mud and drill uh, mud pumps um, um, and mud tanks and whatnot on the surface. So part of that, um, some of the problems we had to solve there, you got there on the um, on your left, um, the anti-torque. So um, the, the whole pipe, of course, um, is has to be static. It's not allowed to turn. Um, and you've got a pruning, if you're, if you're a rotary core and you've got a pruning drawstring within it, another pipe, um, and because of the fluid within those pipes, you get a fluid coupling effect. Effectively, it drags the pipe around and it can disconnect stuff or, or, or get you into all sorts of bother. So those arms there, we, des we designed to flop out, or James designed them at least, um, to flop out and, and basically lock that drawstring up. Um, above that, you see a, um, a weighted collar. That's basically a 400 kilo lump of lead and steel, um, just to ensure that it stays um, firmly contacted with the sea floor. We weren't cementing in either, which is another thing. It's not that typical. Um, partly also to make uh, the drilling operation a lot simpler. So we were just relying on the pipe itself to seal with uh, what we were hoping relatively competent uh, material we're drilling into. Um, and then just above that anti-torque, you've got the cuttings disposal. So that's a ported collar. Basically, all the chips and all the um, material will hopefully exit the system um, at that point. Um, and then we've got the tide compensation on the right. So it's essentially just a spline shaft that slides up and down. We put a bit of grease on it. Um, and that just enables the drill string to go up and down with the Ross uh, ice shaft as it goes through its um, daily tidal cycles. And, 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 and hopefully not load up our um, drill string and bend it. So that requires a lot of effort. So Jane's um, photos before showed you um, just starting out putting in the cellar. The cellar is where all the um, hardware gets lowered in by um, Webster Drilling Bell um, as they are lowering in all that bottom hole assembly they will be lifting it in. So we'll, you can see a high ab on the um, on the right-hand image here. That boom coming in is the high ab coming off the piston bully from Otago, New Zealand. Um, it proved amazing having something able to lift, you know, a ton of um, weight um, and saved us a lot of effort. Um, and then you've got those wooden beams there that the rig will sit on. So you can see uh, in the background photo um, the hot water drill, and that's the capstan that Jane was talking to about before. And in behind that is the actual AIDD. Um, 
So in that cellar, we've got a few tools to hang on to pipe. Um, the cabins, which is a type of pneumatic uh, jaw that you can hit the trigger and it jams on and locks it all up to make sure that you're not going to let anything go. You've got your foot clamps, which is another kind of jaw, which works slightly differently, but um, as part of the drilling operation. Um, so you've got three ways of hanging on to pipe at any one time. Um, now, there is one, there's one part of the operation where we're down to one way of hanging on to that pipe, and, and um, that's the moment that it all started to go wrong for us. So we, uh, using this GRE for the first time, we got the bottom hole assembly, which is all predominantly steel, and pretty, pretty well, I think, uh, the uh, Webster started at like four o'clock in the morning, something like that, and by breakfast it was sitting getting well underway um, and then we would start to uh, by about 10 o'clock that morning we'll start to deploy the um, the glass reinforced epoxy resin pipe so the issue this is a, a Christian chinchuk it's a cross section um, the uh, the purple jaws come in radially so you'll see the plan view there that's you just see a little wee piece they come in there's five of them and then the, the golden um uh piece is um that basically uh acts as a, it's like a bull ring essentially and just it pushes those um pushes the jaws in and it's done uh through spring and hydraulic energy um now trick let's just let's work oh look at that magic so your, your clamping force is applied. Um, these fail safe. So the idea is if you release a hydraulic pressure or you lose hydraulic pressure, the spring will clamp the, um, the, uh, the pipe in, the uh, bowl in, and close on the pipe. So what we've got there is a standard uh, drilling pipe, um, not, not GRE. So the difference between what we were doing uh, and what you would typically do in this kind of drilling is um, we had what we were calling slips. So the GRE had this issue. We had had an upset on it. So it had two different diameters that we had to deal with to get it through the chuck. So we had these things, and I'll show you a picture of the slips in the next slide, but they were there to enable us to deal with the two different diameters so it could pass through that chuck because you're lowering everything through that chuck. All right, I'll click the next one, and then you'll see jaw comes in, rips the pipe. And you can see them all coming in on that little plain view. Um, and then to release uh, hydraulic pressure, acts on that wee piston there with the arrows getting all excited. Um, and that then allows the, um, there's a spring on those jaws, just a little wee wire spring that just puts, uh, eases them out to release the pipe um, and the jaws back in. So that's how they should work. So this is the GRE, um, and these are these slips I was talking about. So the GRE, you'll, I'll, I'm going to show a quick video of the actual two slips that we had before we abandoned, um, and you see some very uh, wide-eyed drillers. <laughs> I've edited out all the swearing. Um, yeah, so the, the GRE, it, it proved actually that uh, the surface finish became a big deal. We couldn't hang on to the stuff because it was quite slippery, because it was geometrically um, variable. So uh, steel pipe is very parallel, um, and um, it's also very uh, round. So those two properties mean that you can hang on to it with a lot of um, certainty. The GRE turns out that's not the case. So there was uh, the, the, the dimer itself varied by about two to three millimeters, and that was sufficient for us to be, in some instances, not be able to hang on to it. Um, and then, um, I mean, we tested this yeah, it's, it's, um, in, in Webster's and in, in, uh, put it on, and we held it 13 tons. And we thought, oh, this is not a problem. Okay, moved on to the next problem. So we, we parked that idea and, and, and um, carried on and, uh, Little did we know we were it was going to come and, come around and bite us. The actual slip in the field, the um, that, that slip at just shy of two thousand uh, kilograms, which is way below what we were testing in the yard. Um, what probably happened is in the yard we lucked out and we got a perfect bit of pipe, and um, we'd had a the, the classic science experiment should always have more than one data point, right? <laughs> it's a lesson. 
Um, yeah, and, and it just turns out that API uh, pipe um, is not made to a very tight manufacturing standard um, because it doesn't need to be. Um, so we got these um, this damage on the jaw. So that, that's the jaws there. So you can see that the three colored arrows by the purple jaw there, and then the arrows are indicated again on the actual physical jaw. So that was the jaw. Um, we, we replaced the jaw twice. So we ended up going down, realizing we had an issue, pulled the jaws out, and we didn't have any reason to pull the jaws out. We just did it because Adam was going, no, we need to check. So we checked and there was this damage. We go, well, okay, that's not good. Um, and there were a few telltales. The damage wasn't, um, which indicated um, this geometry issue we we're having with this pipe. So um, you can see that in some of the, the, the jaw, the, the wear pattern is heavier on some jaws than others. So that sort of told us that the geometry was goofing with us. It wasn't uh, all the forces weren't being applied evenly. So anyway, we we um we replaced the jaws um when we realized we had the issue. Um and then we pulled it out and we thought, just for the hell of it, we'll have another look. And we had another look, and it was exactly the same near pattern. And that was pretty much when we decided we really don't have a good handle on this, so it's best if we don't carry on. And we'd at this point, we're only about 80 meters in, and we'd still so much about 10 percent of the total uh, sea rise that we needed to deploy. So we decided it was probably safer for everyone that we didn't continue. Right now, feeling like does this work? There we go. So that's the chuck going up. The fork clamp will open. There we go. And that's the first slip. So the, the bit to look for is the fork clamp just there. You can just see it open. And that's when the slip. So that's his hanging on to it, opening up slips. Also, here on the when it cycles back, you'll see how much energy is in the system when these beams, which are about five and a half meters long, get thumped into the snow. Okay, so that was that's the one that actually doesn't look too scary. That was the first one. Okay. And if you look at the looks on their faces, you can tell that it's not good. All right. And this is the second one. This is this is the one we were lucky. So coming up to check. Releasing on the foot clamp. What saved us there was that collar. We would have lost everything. So the collar, that the thing that we were trying to get around with those shoes, actually saved us. So, but you can see how much energy is in the system when it, it knocks it down. Um, the whole rig actually sinks, and I think it's sunk, sunk in around about 100 mils into the snow. And we had a lot of bearers on it, so it was it's quite an impressive. I mean, two two tons light hammer will do that, I guess. All right, I'll just quick, quick, uh, talk quickly. So these are these are the tongs. You saw them in the previous um, video. They're there to make up pipe. Um, this is a pretty standard oil field piece of kit um, used for making up um, threaded rod pretty quickly and to improve efficiency. So um, we had sort of done tests on this in the yard and then again in the field and decided that about a 600 foot pound, um, 800 odd newton meters of torque was about right. Um, we didn't really get any uh, makeup pork from the manufacturer. They were a bit cagey on that, so we should have been suspicious, probably. Um, but anywho, we we determined that seemed to be a good number, and we made and with these tongs, you can make up that pork quite consistently. So then we started going down that path with with the, um, set to that pork. However, so once we started recovering um, the pipe. Uh, at the when this all started to go a little bit wrong for us, um, some of the breakout torques were well over um, you know four thousand um, newton meters, which is getting an extraordinary amount of torque. Um, and it, that sort of torque on uh, glass fiber does things like this, where you see that black sharpie circle there. You can just see that fainted part. That's delamination. So it's basically crushing the pipe. Um, the actual uh, scuff marks you see from the jaws are probably not that concerning. Um, you know, you would see that and you'd think, oh, that's fine. But that that sort of percussive kind of um, present delamination is probably means that that pipe is no longer fit for purpose. So 
And you can see the quite the fine threads there, which is why we're um, using the tongs to make up the pipe. Um, just, just improve those efficiencies. So and that was another thing that we discovered. Um, with regular steel pipe, um, the um, the pipe makes up to a shoulder. So it, uh, threads are really hard to make accurately. Um, so the best way to do that is to make everything up to a shoulder. Um, API pipes are effectively like a, a, a BSP pipe fitting that you, any plumber would use. It's this, it's this taper thread pipe. Um, so you're not coming up to a hard shoulder when you make it up. What we had appreciated that this slight inaccuracy in the machining could mean that you could have up to, um, in this instance, I did a drawing. You can just see the number at the top, that's 11. Um, and that's only with two minutes of angular misalignment. And we got 11 millimeters of, uh, of, uh, of off center essentially or run out. Um, but yeah, so this is probably a really good reason why we should go back to a more conventional um, drill pipe as well. And that's what happens when the realization that your season's over, you get a very sad driller. Looking a bit glum there. Right, so uh, what's next? Well, back to back to the uh, steel is real um, mantra as we were all proclaiming at the end of the season. Um, basically, we'll just be more conventional about it. Um, the risk of stalk courses that we still have issues of heat loss. Um, so we've got to do a few numbers on that and whether we can just chuck in a few extra heaters or uh, increase uh, hot water flow to ensure that we don't freeze in. Um, we do have reamers and um, systems that go over the pipe to try and recover it. Um, these things um, are fraught because they can tend to twist around it and um, um, yeah, it makes for a really fun time trying to recover everything as you've got to recover your knots to the surface again. Um, we're going to try and get some folk out to Canada to the um, manufacturer of these um, rigs. Um, the Americans actually use um, the American drilling program, uh, do a lot of work in Greenland and in Antarctica, got an ASIG drill, which is very similar. Um, and they've had some success with the, um, we know that the system can do it. Um, we just need to uh, take stock, have a little think about it, and um, yeah, get more com comfort with the system and, and using this um, um, drill rod, this going more conventional, will hopefully ensure that that's um, the case and we can finally get this call for Richard and Tino, knock the bastard off, as they say. Right, okay. Uh... Hi everyone, my name is Linda Volfort. Um, I'm that person on the screen um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about life and science on the ice. Um, I'll try and speed through it or stick to the highlights and um, yeah, let's go, let's get into it. So this is a screen, a screen grab from Antarctica New Zealand's Instagram and it shows our camp. Um, we've seen nice drawn footage in Richard's uh, talk already, but I just wanted to highlight, these were all of our personal tents. Um, in the back here, it's a bit hard to see, I guess, uh, is the mist tent, which is where we ate most of the time, or all of the time. These are the two science tents, one is warm, one is cold, and then the drill tent in the back here. And uh, another one of Jay Lee's lovely diagrams here of, uh, how camp was set up here. And then I've got a video. Yes. Um, so uh, on a really nice day on the ice, these tents are really, really, really warm. And so you want to actually open everything up um, and I'll spare you the inside of my tent <laughs> there. But uh, on a really nice day, you can you can see as far as the eye can see, and it's just flat ice all around. Um, got a better photo for that later. On a gray day, um, this is actually a pretty good visibility day still, but on a gray day, it's completely wide out. You don't see anything. Um, and so the only way to orient yourself in the field is to look at these pretty little tents. Um, and these tents are not just good props for photos. Um, they're also uh, our only shelter down on the ice. They're quite literally the only place where we're um, protected from the elements. 
Um, and of all of those places, the mess tent is arguably the best one and the most important one because uh, that's where you start your day, you finish your day, you socialize, you unwind, you eat every time you've got any type of break. Um, unless you want to be alone, you probably head to the mess tent. And so I thought I'd show you what it looks like to walk out of the mess tent onto the Ross Ice Shore. Look at the noise. Um, so this is just walking out of the mess tent. And then you step onto a nice day on, on the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, the blue building there is a toilet. Got a piston bullet there. Got the black flags that indicate fuel lines or at least places that you need to be aware of danger. Uh, the tent, the drill tent was in the back there. And then we swing back to Tent City here. Um, as I said, tents are really important. Mess tents are really important. Uh, and yeah, we got to unwind at the end of the season at the Christmas party or get together. And this is me looking really stoked with my uh, secret Santa gifts. It's a good day. Christmas on the ice is a good day. Um, and then ultimately it came time to leave. To leave. And uh, yeah, then you really see um, in what kind of environment you are. Sorry for the noise. Um, really short video, um, but just wanted to highlight the white line you see is not camp. That's the, uh, well, it's also camp, but that's the runway. Camp is actually those few black dots that are sitting right above that. So, um, we are in the middle of nowhere and I promise you that behind me in this photo is the exact same view of nothingness, uh, 360 degrees around. So you might be wondering, um, uh, on this you've been paying attention to the previous presentations, why we'd be going here for science. Um, and so, yeah, after we have our hole open in the ice, we lower our cores in there. So this is the gravity core. Those uh, gray bands you see sitting there are weights. And so it's a pretty heavy piece of equipment. Uh, you lower it down through the ice shelf and then you basically let it free fall into the sediments below. And because of the weight, it sinks quite deep in. Um, and then, the valve at the top there closes, which puts the core tube under vacuum, and then you recover your sediment core, if you're lucky, um, and do a good job. We've been successful at the Cam Ice Stream uh, with this one before at KISS 2, um, two years ago, and then KISS 1 the season before that. Um, but what hasn't been successful at the side because has been the hammer core. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a good photo of this, um, mainly because it is three meters long and had to be assembled over the borehole, which is what Gavin and Richard are doing here. Um, but basically, it's three meters long. It's got a bunch of weights on it. You set it onto the seafloor, where you lower it down the borehole, set it onto the seafloor, and then you manually pull on the rope on the surface to move the hammers, uh, sorry, the weights up to release them and manually hammer the core into the ground. And that looks uh, something like this, and this is gonna be loud, I'm sorry. Uh, wait, can I, no, or not. Anyway, so here you see uh, everyone kind of having a go at uh, trying to hammer this core in. Uh, and now, mind you, the core is now 600 meters below our feet in this photo, so it's really hard to control that on such a small, uh, I mean, you've got 40 centimeters to move before you pull it out of the sediments again. Um, and so you need to be careful with and not overdo it. Um, that was the first time we were successful at the cyber coast with this core. And simultaneously, we got the longest sediment core ever recorded on the cyber coast. So you see Tina, Richard, and Gavin uh, being super stoked with the core that we collected. Um, that sediment core and the others that we collected were chopped in those sections and x-rayed in the field, which is what I'm doing in the photo next to it. And um, yeah, skipping was a bit of a common theme, but um, this made us and me really happy to see sediment cores come out of the ground. Um, but why are we interested in sediments? So I'll just give a really quick high level overview of why the sediments matter and how we connect them to environments um, and a little bit of context, which has been given already. So we all know climate change is happening um, and Temperatures are going to rise uh, to the end of the century, probably, it's projected, um, depending on what socioeconomic pathway we are taking. And we have seen since 2002 that the Antarctic ice sheet uh, in, its to total, in its total has been losing mass. Um, you see that on the left-hand side of this graph. And on the right-hand side, you have the equivalent of sea level change resulting from these mass, mass changes. Um, the overall of the Antarctica is the green line that you see 
I can't find, it's the green line over there. Um, the blue line is East Antarctica, which is over there. Um, it's also the blue section, and that has actually been gaining mass over this time period. Um, but West Antarctica, the red or salmon, um, has been losing mass quite significantly from this time period. Um, and we know if we look at sea level rise projections that this is not linear at all um, and that sea level rise will continue not just until 2100, but also after that, as Richard also highlighted. Um, and there are a lot of uncertainties with the Antarctic ice sheet and the way that it behaves. And so um, not only is Antarctica, the ice sheet itself, important for sea level rise because it holds so much sea level equipment in it, roughly 60 meters if it were to melt, if everything were to melt, um, it is also important for global ocean circulation and the amount of albedo um, that gets, uh, the amount of sunlight that gets reflected back into the atmosphere. So it's a really important continent for a multitude of reasons. Uh, and so if we want to project our future, we actually need to start in the present uh, because we need to understand what's happening nowadays um, to be able to infer what's been happening in the past. And so, ta-da. Um, just a few modern analogs from places we all know, probably. This is Franz Josef. Um, you can see that it, the glacier has carved itself a nice valley over time. And now that it's retreating, it's leaving behind quite a lot of different sizes of rocks. You can see a little bit of the rubble here. Um, and it's that goes from mud to smallest grain size to, you know, massive boulders. Um, and that's because ice is so strong. It just bulldozes everything, basically. This is also happening in Antarctica. Um, that is happening there underneath the grounded ice, which is the ice sheet. And then it's floating extensions we call the ice shelves. Um, sorry, I'll, should I, I'll answer questions afterwards, if that's all right. Um, all right, so it's also happening underneath the ice sheet. And so we can infer that if we find one of those deposits in Antarctica, we know that there was grounded ice present during the time that those rocks were deposited, being deposited. Um, and so we call that rock type a dimecton, uh, and so indicative of granite ice, in this case at least. Um, right, sorry. If we then move further underneath the ice shelf, like right next in the center of where it says null zone here, it's a place where there's very little current activity, um, which means that there's very little going on in terms of sedimentation. And the only thing that you'll find is something that you'll also find in the abyssal plains of the ocean is mud. Um, and so when you find mud in these glacial marine environments, you can infer that there was that there was deposition underneath an ice shelf. Similarly, the open ocean um, in Antarctica, when the sea ice melts every summer, um, you see these big phytoplankton blooms occurring. Um, and when these little algae shells fall down, die, and they fall down to the bottom of the ocean, um, they end up in a deposit that's uh, more than 50% fossils, and the other rest is just lithic, so sand, grain, mud. Um, and so when you find that, which we call a diatomase, then you can infer that um, this was deposited in an open ocean environment. So now that we know how these rocks occur from understanding our processes, we can use that to inform our past. And if you can then date these deposits, you can understand uh, what the ice has been doing uh, during past times when temperatures were higher or lowered. You can find out what's been happening. Um, and so that's this, this one. Again, just to highlight where we were, um, and before I show you some of the preliminary results, I want to stress that we have not looked at these cores in person. So this is all just very high level speculation about what might actually be happening in the core cores. Uh, I got a bit of a curation, of course. The furthest to the right is that two meter long core. I had to chop it off, otherwise you can see any, any detail here. Um, but if we use that framework, what I just previously discussed, uh, and we look at these x-rays, which are the ones that I took in the field. Um, brighter colors here are higher density. And so you can see that, especially in the bottom of all of these cores, um, you have quite a few different class of different sizes with random orientation. There's not really, they don't really make any sense. It's just a mess. Um, and so from these x-rays, again, preliminary inferences, uh, we could say that that was deposited underneath grounded ice. And so there was uh, yeah, there was grounded ice at that moment in time. Now, since this location is currently underneath an ice shelf, 
and quite close to the ground line of the Western Antarctic Ice Sheet, we will not expect, we wouldn't expect to see muds or diatom oozes this close to the sea, sur uh, to the sea surface, uh, ocean floor surface. Um, but what we are seeing here, potentially, maybe, is an increase in current activity the further up you go into the core. And so at one point, maybe in the top 10-ish centimeters, um, you start to see that these, ran these random plants start to get a preference for a way that they like to sit into the core. Um, and you can only really get that when something is deposited through a fluid. Um, and so we infer that, you could infer from that, that the uh, grounding zone at that point has retreated over the site. And so you could, you could see that this is an ice retreat sequence, very high level, um, in a very high level way. But if you just look at one place in this isolation, so KISS, one, KISS 3 up there again, the big blob in the middle is the Ross Ice Shelf. I should have really labeled this. Um, one place, one location is not enough to infer what's happening in all of the Ross Ice Shelf. And so if you can date those deposits and then link them to the depositional environments and do that for all of these lovely little dots that have been, um, these dots, by the way, are coring sites in this, in this area. Um, sediment coring sites. If you can correlate all of that through the through the sediment cores, you could look at how the ice has retreated since the last time that it was at its um, maximum extent to where the ice is right now. Um, here, really quickly, the dark line, the dark blue line on the top right, um, with the 20 on it, is its maximum ice extent 20,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum. So that's when grounded ice extended as far like onto, quite far onto the continental shelf, um, and you can see a 5,000 year stepwise way in which well this is shown for each 5,000 years uh, the way where uh, in which the grounding line has retreated, um, but you see all of the dots in the open ocean over here, um, but there's relatively few sitting on it are uh, collected from actually underneath the Ross Ice Shelf. And that's where we need to find most of our answers uh, at this point in time. We need higher resolution from under, like more cores and more proof from underneath the Ross Ice Shelf about what has happened since the last glacial maximum and how the ice is retreated so that we can get a better understanding of the rate mechanisms and the triggers for its retreat in the past. And then going back to my diagram, uh, now that we know that, we can put that back into our future um, projections. And the, the more data we have, the uh, more we reduce uncertainties around these projections and the better we can plan for our futures or better understand what our futures might look like. Wow, that was a whirlwind, I'm tired, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that was me. Thanks all. That was a long, long series of, of talks, and I appreciate your um, your patience and your willingness to listen um, from the from the high level objectives of the Space Two C project to the details of how we actually melt a hole through the ice shelf to the um, trials and tribulations of trying to put a drill rig on the ice shelf and recover sediments from beneath the seafloor, which is not a simple thing to do. To some of the preliminary scientific results that we actually did achieve this season. Um, that form form the basis for, for Linda's PhD. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope you've got a taste of what we're about. Um, we are going to go back this November with steel. We're confident we're going to actually be able to drill deep beneath the seafloor to achieve that um, primary goal of getting that long-term record. And despite Darcy's um, somewhat um, gloomy presentation of, of of the challenges, he's not he's not. You know, lying here. This is a difficult thing to do. We're supremely confident we're going to be successful and be able to bring you the the longer term story um, in, in January this year. So, um, so with that, we're happy to happy to answer any questions that you might have um, on any of those topics. Yeah, Richard, the uh, gravity core. Mm. Yeah, the gravity core that was taken, um, the diamicron, is how competent is the matrix around those clasps? Is it loose or have you got a feel for... I'm just thinking about when we go back down and we're trying to core that stuff in the near surface. Um, no, I totally get what you're asking, Jeff. And and we were... So a couple of things with that we, we considered incredibly successful this season was obviously making the hot water hole, but being able to see what the seafloor was actually made of. Um, and, and we were concerned, um, Tina Vanderflip, my co-chief scientist, and I were concerned about 
um, giving the go-ahead to use what we call as a hydraulic piston corer, which yes. is one of the, as you know, Jeff, one of the, but for the others, one of the coring tools we use, um, essentially, you, you, you put pressure, you have, you, you have this, this um, coring device that you overpressure and it shoots a, a, a core barrel out into the seafloor very rapidly. So you get nice, clean, complete sediment, but it only works if it's relatively soft sediment. Um, if you try to punch that into a hard sediment, you can end up bending things and create all sorts of problems. We were a bit concerned that that might happen, but we now know that we were able to hammer core, so driving that hammer core um, three meters. It went three meters down into uh, below the seafloor. So the fact that we were able to hammer core down suggests we should be able to piston core and it's sticky enough and, and firm enough that we think the stinger, the, the thing that's going to lock into the seafloor, will actually be able to hold, but it's soft enough to piston core. So that's information we have that we now that we didn't have. Yeah, so we're yeah. pretty confident to give the go-ahead to, to shoot that piston core off. Yeah, because yeah. it was always a bit of a concern about what we could see in that top yeah. section, and it looks like, you know, we've got a way now yeah. of seeing what was there. Yeah, no, totally. So so, so that, was a, that was a win. Uh, yes. Yeah, of course. This is sorry. This is first time I've been to these talks. It's all completely new. Probably the question I'm asking sounds weird. Um, where? How do you know where to find the location to drill it? Where's the best location to start drilling? Why did you choose that area? A little bit tongue in cheek. Um. Shall I, shall I have a crack at that? So Jane mentioned the the the, the X that we drew on a on a map um, a number of years ago, and and that the location was chosen because we asked the ice sheet modelers, um, yeah, with, with with a previous drilling project, we'd found evidence that the ice shelf and ice sheet had retreated, but lots of, lots of our colleagues were asking, well, how do you know that the West Antarctic ice sheet actually collapsed? That it's not just local retreat and open marine conditions that you may not have lost the whole West Antarctic ice sheet. So we asked the modelers to show us where they thought the most sensitive region was. If, if, if that place was to melt, there's absolutely no way you could have maintained a, a West Antarctic ice sheet. And that's kind of what that X was. So that guided us as to where we should go to try to look to drill. But then we had to go out and do a whole bunch of geophysical surveys, shooting seismic across the ice, so Hugh, Hugh Horgan and a bunch of others, lots of hard work going out, setting off explosives along the surface of the ice to get a, an image of the sub seafloor to even find if there are sediments there. Because what we didn't want to do is go out and dr drill into granite. Um, some, of, some of our geologist colleagues would like to drill into granite, but not for us. So to find those sediments in the right place, was was the, a lot of work we had to do. Of course, we still don't know if those sediments are the right age. If we don't even know if they are twenty million years old or five million years old, we have we know that the surface is recent, but but what's at depth we really don't know yet until we drill. So there's still a bit of a roll of the dice, but we think we've given ourselves a pretty good chance of of getting the right age materials. So. How much of this? How much of the surface you've gone down? I didn't catch. So this year we melted a hole that was 580 meters, depending on who you talk to, 580 meters thick through the ice shelf, then 50 meters of ocean cavity, and then the seafloor itself we only went two meters, well three meters into, but we got two meters of core. We actually want to drill at least 150, but even deeper, 200 meters below the seafloor to get that sedimentary record. Well, if you add the, if you add them all up. Mm -hmm. It's it's eight hundred meters, yeah, Ooh. yeah, and that's why Darcy was saying we went with fiberglass to try to reduce the amount of weight we have to hang off what is a relatively small drill rig, and we chose a relatively small drill rig because we want to be able to go all around the continent ultimately, yeah. But we realise now we have to use steel; we can't use fiberglass because it's slipped. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, in the future we might. We'll have another crack at it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. One day. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, generally in science, increasingly and always has been a pressure on how to get funding for social good. Um, in Antarctica, there's a real boom for, for better or worse, there's a boom for tourism to Antarctica. Is that an industry you're facing pressure from? Is it something you see as a threat, an opportunity? 
if there's some dopey billionaire that offers you millions of dollars? I'm, I can answer that, but I'm going to let someone else have a crack. Do you want to have a go at that, Jane? You want to... I'll definitely talk about run doping billionaire. Um, yeah, yeah uh, Elon Musk's uh, Starlink was a revelation this season. Um, so, you know, as much as these billionaires are sometimes a right raw pain in the ass, um, they do have some good goodness in them. Maybe not, actually. I'll take that back. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I don't know. Could we take their money? I don't know. I don't. Uh, can I can I add something to that? I think I think there are obviously concerns about right? there are obviously concerns about tourism in these places uh, for sure, and I don't know the ins and outs for all of that. But I do think we cannot discount the value of the general public being able to see these places and understand why they're valuable and understand why we need to protect them. And we can show you a million photos, but you'll never truly get the 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 enormity of the continent until you've been there and the, its importance. And yeah, I think there's a lot of value to give to tourism down there. There's obviously a big list of caveats attached to that as well. But that's my two cents. And just to add on to that, I think um, often tourism these days, it's actually pretty high net worth individuals, as quote unquote. Um, often the people going down there. Um, and I think the people that I know that are actually going down as um, sort of guides or science um, uh, people to, to talk about what's actually happening in Antarctica. They find that people unanimously, when they actually get to go down there, are finding they're suddenly very concerned about climate change if they weren't before uh, and about protecting Antarctica. Yep. Um, what was the tidal range? 2.4 metres. Meters. Yeah. Nice. In the vertical. We can tell you the current speed too. Was it it's it's... No. Is it no, it was it's a different cyclicity. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you got the moon and the uh, sun phases going in and out of phase. And so some days it'd be just a nice clean tide, and other days it'd be complete chaos. So, yeah. If he's a tidal experts here, I'm sure they'd know more about it. But... We had a complete model. Part of the part of the thing with um, with the drilling, we needed to know where we were at all times, and so we had a, a total, a complete tidal model for that for that period that we were then able to ensure that we knew where we were on the borehole at any time, uh, which we pretty pretty much ran on the spreadsheet um, uh, on Excel. Um, and just hit the each time, and get the information, get the length, see that we were right. Why do you call in November? It's a better weather. Question was, why do we go in November? Yes, uh, summer season is when all science happens down there. Um, we have to wait for, it's around October, where the traverse can actually go out ahead of us. They have to go across a crevasse zone, which is just off Ross Island. Um, and that's around about October. They have to blast that in to make the route accessible. Uh, and then it's uh, a matter of getting the fueling and all that tic tac with um, our colleagues in the US program who assist us with a lot of logistics to actually be able to get the traverse out there, which is about a two week um, traverse. And then uh, once they're up there, they have someone who can groom a runway and we can start to get air support out there. How do we get the food and everything supplied? So there's actually one um, ship supply each year um, to Ross Island, and pretty much that is the main supply for both McMurdo Station and uh, Scott Base. And so the food comes out um, all in one hit, and then it's eked out over the year. Um, obviously, we've got good freezer capability down there. Um, and obviously, as well, we get flights with freshies and things like that getting flown in. Um, but there's a an ordering system, obviously, that's needed for things like field uh, events as well. What do you do with all the material from the core samples once you've analysed it, photographed it, x-rayed it, um, taken all the data from it? What happens to the actual material that you extract? Um, so, yeah, once we, we do... Um, initially, we're going to do non-destructive measurements, right? So you're, you're taking, um, say, X-rays or CT scans or um, 
Oh, whatever else my brain can't think about right now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but and then you've got the structure of measurements like like grain size or looking for fossils or or any of the other methods where you'd actually need to take a physical sample. Um, if you don't use everything up, uh, it stays within the core tube. The the core itself, by the way, uh, gets split. So one half uh, is an archive half, just so that it stays the way it is, and it stays within an archive, of course. Um, and the other half is the working half. So that's where we take the samples from and all that kind of stuff. And whatever uh, stays behind, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, from the working half will 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 also go into an archive or will stay accessible for some in some way um, for people to continue to work on if they wanted to. There's a since you get a museum of Antarctic cores in Oregon at the moment. So most of the cores that have been collected from Antarctica from ships um, around the continent and on the on the um, beneath the ice shelves, uh, it's, it's called it's stored in a curation facility at Oregon um, Oregon State University is the is the marine um, uh, marine core store. So we'll actually end up sending our cores over to Oregon State at Edinburgh. Um, the cores that are recovered from off in the deeper ocean, there are archives stored in um, Texas and in Kochi in Japan, Rob, maybe some from Antarctica. So all of this material is actually stored in, at, at refrigerated at four degrees so it doesn't go moldy for scientists, for research, for people who are interested in the future to go back and, and have a look. Because it costs so much to get these things, because it's so hard to get the materials, we don't just um, chuck it away. Yeah. Yeah, it's really more of an observation, um, but I can't help but be impressed uh, with um, uh, the difficulties that you guys have faced in in this sort of drilling. I mean, uh, deep sea drilling is so easy and straightforward. Mm -hmm. Just drilling through an ice sheet, you get delivered to the top. You don't have to go through an ice shelf. Uh, so that's one thing. But look, the other thing is it's so good to have you here to talk about your problems. Uh, it must be quite hard to do, but I think you did it really well. And uh, yeah, just uh, we know you're going to have another go. I'll just I'll just you know, emphasize that, Peter. I mean, a lot of these scientific endeavors, um, you know, we often hear about the the success stories, right? Everything's ah, oh, we did all this and it was all rem remarkable and amazing. And this season, we knew we were going down and there was a big risk, a big challenge. This, as Peter's just said, it's not logistically or technically simple to do any of what we did. And I, I was on the night shift the, the, when the sea riser weights were being put down the, the hole and I went to bed um, watching the drillers pretty much smiling. Things were going really well. Um, and then I got up and came back to the drill tent at four o'clock and everything was dead quiet. There was no action. And the, everyone was standing around sort of scratching their head and you know, shaking their heads a little bit, and lots of deep thinking. And I went, oh, shit, um, this doesn't look great. And um, we had a big serious conversation. Darcy was there. We had a, had, a, had a big conversation about what had happened. We went away. We thought about things for a while. And my first thought was, I, I'd said to my wife before we left um, to go down to Antarctica that this was going to be my last trip, which probably is the reason why we weren't as successful as we needed to be. But And, and so she posted it on Facebook that it was my last trip. And all these people said, oh, you know, well, you know, that's a bit sad, Richard. It's an end of an era. And I was like, oh, it's great because, you know, younger people can do it and I don't have to sleep on the ground um, in a tent anymore. And so my first thought was, oh, man, I'm going to have to come, come back and do this all again. And then I thought about all of the logistical effort to get out to the drill site and all of the effort to get the gear and, and the, the traverse and the weather lined up and the planes, it's just an unbelievably difficult thing to do. And as I was thinking all of this, I started thinking, holy, holy cow, we, we're amazing. We've just done this amazing amount of stuff just to get here, to make the hole through the ice shelf, to get some gravity cores, to get some oceanographic data. And we started to realize all of the successes we'd had. And yeah, a major part of the operation hadn't worked, but we'd also not dropped things on the seafloor. We'd learned about what the seafloor 
composition is. And you start really thinking, oh no, this is actually a really successful endeavor. Everyone's still healthy. Most people are smiling. No fingers are lost. And you start going, ah, this is part of the scientific endeavor. This is part of a human adventure. And you start feeling good again. And you start hearing that, oh, we can actually fix this with steel. We weren't saying we're done. We're absolutely, there's history. We, we, we can't do anything. There are solutions. So then we're getting on the on the phone, literally because of Elon Musk, Starlink, to order pipe to get it on the plane so we could come back the next season. So it was a real shift and a real spin around and just watching this team go from glum to actually this is pretty awesome to okay, now, now what do we need to do to succeed? Um, because we all recognize how important the science is, how important the knowledge is, the knowledge that we get trying to gain by understanding just how, how sensitive the Ross Ice Shelf is because it matters to people all around the world and including people in Aotearoa and around our coastline. It just really lifts you up. So it was a really interesting experience to go through and, and, a, and a real example of, 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 a, of, a, um, of a major human endeavor in the challenge of, of science. It's, it's not a simple thing to do. So, so yeah, I agree, Peter. It's difficult. Yeah. We've been involved in these scientific drilling programs since 1983, and this is a success. It's mm. a partial success, mm. but yep. it's there. It's, yep. Yep. it's part of the story. Yes, I, go for it. Go for it next season. I, I agree, Jeff. I also think, um, you know, when we think about all of the amazing things that the New Zealand, um, a, a lot of New Zealanders have been involved in, in successful drilling projects in Antarctica, most of them weren't. Um, successful in the first season. A lot of them you had to go back the second and even third time to, to, to be successful because you learn as, as these things go. And like I said, I was just really happy that we didn't have to come back and explain why we left a bunch of stuff on the seafloor. That was a that was a big win. Not to say it can't still happen. We've got to be on our on our game. It's it's, it's still risky, but it's worth the risk for the returns. Yep. Will the whole stay in the ice for the next time you go down, or do you have to redrill that? Yeah, so we, another thing we haven't really talked about is that, is that hole, when we finished with it, the coring, we actually stuck an oceanographic mooring down the hole. So we've got oceanographic equipment that right now is sending data back to us um, that you can download. You can't because it's secret at the moment, but <laughs> we can download it from the from the web and we've, uh, ocean, oceanographers will analyse it and then share that information once we understand it. So that hole is actually full, full of equipment and is frozen in. But before we left, we moved um, about 50 metres to the south, south, yeah, southish towards the mountains and punched a, put another flag in the ground for the second hole. So we're going to have to drill a whole new one, which is a lot of effort. But we now know how thick the ice shelf is. So um, there's no guessing. We had a competition last year to guess how thick the ice shelf was. And James actually won it, one of the um, hot water drillers won it, and his prize was to jump into the flubber, the, 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 the pool of water at the end of the season, which I personally didn't think was a prize, but um, it's cold, it was cold, so yeah. Anyway. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maury Benuda. I'm the chairman of the uh, Wellington Antarctic Society. Now, the Antarctic Society has um, been sponsoring such an event this, this year for 91 years. And uh, 91 years ago, they, a group such as yourselves and explorers put together and established the society. And there was a lot of interesting names on the list who's put it forward. Are we fortunate that you guys decided at a young age to become scientists? Are we fortunate that you added to it to be involved in Antarctica and deal with some very serious issues. And um, we're fortunate that you're prepared to come here tonight and speak to us. And I'd like if you go in the room to give them a good round of applause and thank them for coming. And I'd also like to let you know that sitting on that table is the magazines of the society. And if any of you would like to take one who's not a member, uh, you can find an application form in the back of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.